Good evening and welcome to the first of two final Inside Government programs for the fall uh, 2021 semester here at KU Community College. This is something that's uh, broadcast on Spectrum, Verizon Files, the Auburn Regional Media Access, better known as ARMA, as well as this college's radio station, Win 89.1. I'm your host, Guy Cosentino. We are delighted literally to have in the studio our first guest, freshman assemblyman John Lawrence who took office in uh, January representing the 126th Assembly District. That includes uh, much of the city of Auburn, uh, encompasses the city of Auburn, uh, all of Southern Cuyahoga County and parts east into Onondaga County. I say delighted because the last time we tried this, it was Zoom and he's, la he's laughing right now. It did not go well. So uh, we are glad that he's in the studio. He's been in Auburn today uh, where he has an office, but also in Auburn because he's been doing several events. Uh, but we're going to talk about uh, the New York State budget, uh, what was passed, because the day he came on was supposed to be April 1st. We have a new governor. We'll talk about that, as well as what's in the news this week, including the reappearance of Andrew Cuomo. And we'd also like to know what he thinks will be coming up on the next uh, legislative session that starts in January and what his plans are this next year. So welcome back in Thank the you. studio uh, today. We're delighted Very to nice have to be you. here. So... Um, Separate from everything else that we'll talk about, sure. uh, today is Veterans Day. I know yes. you were, so we're taping this at about three o'clock on uh, uh, Thursday, um, Veterans Day, but uh, today at 11 o'clock, you were at uh, Veterans Park uh, for Correct. a city ceremony. So, and again, I wrote these questions I told you before I read the citizens this morning. You're a veteran. Yes. What does this day mean to you? Today, somber recognition of what being an American means. Today is a reflection of the sacrifice of all of those who have gone before us and all of those who hopefully will come after us and feel the same indebtedness to this beautiful country in recognizing the things that we have that are unique to being an American. And so this day symbolizes not only all of those things, but most importantly, the sacrifice of those whom did not come home. So where did you serve and how long did you serve? I served for 27 years uh, all over the world. I was in uh, seven different states. I was stationed in two different places in Germany. I served both in Iraq and Afghanistan and several other Middle Eastern countries as well and uh, um, have been literally all over. And that's as, as a result of uh, um, the Army's worldwide mission. We are in uh, on just about every continent all the time, keeping our country here safe. And you left as a colonel? As a colonel, correct. Colonel. Yeah. And so I, I know you were at, uh, city, uh, at the city today with a number of other dignitaries at Veterans Park. What else are you doing today? So I am... Uh, uh, immediately after leaving here, I'm picking up my family, and then we are going to the VFW, which I'm a life member of, in Lafayette, New York. That's my home VFW, uh, and we're going to eat dinner there as a family with the families of other veterans. And you have two children? I have had three. We have two. Right. And how old are your children? Our daughter is a 16 and a 10th grader. Our son is 12 and a 7th grader. So let's talk about what is going on right now. Sure. Uh, when you were here in Auburn for the Culinary Institute opening yeah. uh, around uh, mid-July, uh, there was a woman who shared the podium with you. At that point, she was the lieutenant governor. Correct. I think within about two weeks, it became known that she was going to become the governor. Yes. But we have Kathy Hochul as the new governor. She's been governor now for about 60 days. How's she doing so far? So I want to... I want to tell you that uh, I didn't know she was coming. I didn't know that they had had me sitting next to her. <laughs> and I didn't know that they had us speaking nearly together right after right after one another. So uh, I was very impressed with her. I liked her. And I want to make sure that we give her time to settle into the role before casting uh, any kind of judgment whatsoever. Do you think that means that in January there will be some type of honeymoon for her? Uh, you know, I know that's another two months away, yeah. but that's when she will release her budget yeah. and her priorities. Do you think there'll be some grace period in there? 
I, I don't think there should ever be a grace period per se for a leader in any position. You must accept the mantle of responsibility that comes with your position, regardless of the circumstances that put you there. And I think she understands that. And I, I think that uh, um, the people of New York are looking at her with open eyes and open ears and a clean slate. So her predecessor, Andrew Cuomo, yes. we'll get into the other stuff in a minute. He was not necessarily somebody who would reach across the aisle uh, to the assembly minority. I, I agree with that completely. Uh, so has she done anything to start? And again, you haven't really been, you haven't had a session. No. So I know uh, George Pataki and others did hot dog roasts and, and all that type yeah. of stuff at the executive mansion. Yeah. Um, has she reached out or her people in her administration reached out to assembly Republicans? In that manner, uh, no. Not, okay. not that I'm aware of. And I, I would have expected from, it, this was a very sore, sore point with the, with the previous governor. He never, in the entire legislative session, the previous one, never reached out to us, never said hello, never said welcome. These are things that leaders do. I, regardless of, this is, has nothing to do with party, has nothing to do with platform or position. This has to do with decency because we're all there to the old Ronald Reagan theory. Yes. That you're all humans. Yes. And you all hopefully have a common purpose. Correct. Well, I, I'll get into what else is going on at the, at the governor's level. But, uh, you know, there is right now, yesterday, there was some release of uh, some Tish Jan Attorney General's uh, uh, transcripts. Are you satisfied at this point uh, about the pending criminal process? Not the Tish James items, but the criminal uh, Albany County uh, in Eastern New York, they're going through a process. Are you happy with what you're seeing from the outside? No, not at all. Not and not not as a citizen or an assembly member. I I, I want to give you know you have to give justice, due process, and it's fair. It's fair time. You have to let that process go. Um, but I feel like the outcome should have been um, expedited, especially. For on the behalf of women that worked in that office. Again, I look, I, you know, I'm a father, I'm a husband, same as you. I've got a 16 year old daughter. Would she be safe as an intern in his office? No. So where do you think, how do you think, uh, obviously it led to his eventual resignation. How do you think the attorney general's process worked? Cause that's separate from the criminal prosecution. Correct. Um, I thought it was, again, you have to give justice its process. It has to be deliberate. Um, I would have liked to have seen it go faster, but I also want to believe that, that they are doing what needs to be done in the way it needs to be done on behalf of the people. So work York. product you don't follow. It could have been process-wise. It could have gone faster. Yes, I think there was political manipulation in there and incentive to go slower than, than necessary. So uh, clearly the former governor is got going away in the media because the same day that they released uh, the transcripts, it now looks like the assembly uh, judiciary is going to quote unquote review. So I want to know what that means to you. Uh, their uh, uh, report, originally the speaker said that was all done and gone and then there was a backlash from the public and the media, I think from other members of the, yeah. the legislature, including people on the Judiciary Committee, both Democrats and Republicans, and they're now going to review these findings. Do you think they'll be made public? I have no idea, but I hope so. I, to be honest with you, I think they should be. I think this is a matter of um, the sanctity of our system has been violated in some ways. And the public deserves to know exactly how and why and what the actions taken were. I, I, I think that they that information should be public at some point. Can the rank and I know uh, yeah. Assembly Republicans are in the, the vast majority minority. Yeah. So you don't have the power to do that. But do you think you would have enough crossover Democrats who would want to make whatever report there is public other than it will eventually leak out? Because you've been in Albany now yeah. nine months. It'll leak out at some point, 10 months. I don't think so. 
I, th I think I think if that were the case, we would have seen we would have seen Democrats, um, both men and women, being much more aggressive in their mandate for the governor to resign. Okay. And that never happened. They waited until it was safe. They refused to take a position. Our job. They waited for the attorney general. Correct. Our job as leaders is to is to make decisions on behalf of the people we represent, not take the safe road. So have you decided for next year who you're going to support for governor? No. So one. So it's. Oh, it's, you mean uh, for <laughs> governor of the, on the Republican? Yeah, yeah, I have. And who is that? Lee Zeldin. So let me ask you, uh, because the, one of the criticisms of Lee Zeldin is that he has not wanted to certify, he was not willing to certify the presidential election of 2020. Uh, do you agree with him? I don't know what his reasoning was on that. So um, it, without speaking to him personally, I don't want to pass judgment on him. So the other question that a number of Republicans I've heard talk is, a lot of this stuff was done in June of this year with the election a year away. Republicans haven't had a convention. I'm assuming they'll have a convention to nominate. They haven't had primaries or anything like that. It does seem like Lee Zeldin is going to be the nominee, though there are two other well-known candidates running at this stage, including Rob Astorino, yes. who was the nominee uh, two ago. Previously. Uh, previously. Yes. Is it just early in the process? I think they're all qualified. I think they're all great, great people. Um, it was very difficult um, to choose one, but again, I view my role as one that has to be decisive. And and waffling in any leadership role doesn't serve the people. So, to specifically answer your question, I I just um, I don't know why. It's transpired the way it has. Okay. Uh, and again, this all came out largely before the resignation. So, yeah. you know, we all, we, things can change, yes. as you know, in Albany quite quickly. So let's talk about some things that we wanted to talk to you about on April 1st. Sure. One was the budget. Okay. Uh, uh, well, first of all, did you vote for all the parts of the budget? No. Did so you, I, 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 what did you support and what didn't you support? So largest budget ever, $212 billion. There, there are lots of pieces in there that were good, but uh, overall, I had to vote. Uh, I, I felt that uh, I could not vote um, for it because of some of the some of the specific aspects of it. So, so you voted against all the budget bills, or did you support any of the budget bills? Um, I think I, I supported one of them. So what did you like? What didn't you like? What I what I didn't like was the number one, the totality of it. I think I think that that will create debt um, beyond what we can beyond what we should uh, do to our children and our grandchildren. Uh, again, just to bring that into scope, our budget here in New York is larger than than both the Florida budget and uh, um, the Texas budget. And so when you look at the number of people involved, 20, 20 million here, uh, it, it just it to me as a as a first time voter on the budget, it didn't make sense to me. I, I would never manage my personal checkbook that way and feel that there's an obligation to be fiscally conservative with your money and with the with the people's money. So there's some breakouts of things that are now coming to fruition literally six months later. One yep. of those is prison closures. Yes. So uh, this week the governor announced uh, the closure of six prisons, uh, including one in Seneca County that is not in your district. Uh, do you agree with the decision to close prisons to start with? So I debated against this very aggressively. and Against the bill. So there was, she was given permission, she, he, because yes. it was a different governor at that time, Correct. was given permission in the budget, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing this, to, to allow them the discretion to close prisons. Correct. Okay. And so she has an, acted on that. Okay. So my, what I debated specifically was the uh, within 30 days piece of that. 
And so, so explain that to the, people who the, may not be. He had the, dis, the discretion to close a prison essentially immediately. And the upheaval that that would cause to our criminal justice system, to the uh, corrections officers and staffs in those prisons just to arbitrarily close them with essentially no warning, no notice, um, that I, I view that to be a terrible and wrong and thing manufacturing, to do. manufacturing, if it's a unionized shop, it's six months, if I remember correctly, under federal law. So you at least give notice to, to uh, manufacturing employees uh, longer than you would for your own employees as a state. I had to close several uh, entities in the Army, and we took a very long-term approach. We asked every single person, thousands of them, what their needs were and did it very methodically so that the number of people negatively impacted was very few. We can do the same thing in New York. So what happens to these six facilities? I don't know what will happen to them. Okay. That's a great question. So uh, so the New York Times this week is reporting, that, and they're not rationalizing, but they're reporting some numbers. And one of the interesting numbers they said they report on is that incar incarcerations since 1999 are by half, by 50%. So you, would you agree with A, that analysis, that it, it's down 50% and that you might have to look at closures if your, your population's that reduced? I think it's always possible to manip manipulate data. And if you look at what's transpired in just the last year, I would never agree with that. Okay. Be the the rioting and looting, unmitigated allowance of this to happen throughout multiple cities, our very own New York, and to varying degrees locally here in Syracuse, this happened as well. The if if public safety was really an issue for the previous governor, and I hope it becomes a more a more pressing issue for the current governor then they would be putting criminals in jail, not forcing them out. So that's where I want to go with this. So I was wondering if those numbers, again, I agree with you on the, the issue. You can, data can be sliced and diced yep. to make your arguments. But it does seem that the legislature and, and the former governor, because you can't, I don't think you can pin it on this particular governor, whether it's bail reform, decriminalization of marijuana, other items, we are incarcerating fewer people at this at this state right now, correct? We are, and we're reducing retroactively the sentences. sentencing of, of, of former of former um, formerly charged people to, across the spectrum of different different types of crimes. So um, one of which is is I'm sure you're gonna get to it marijuana. I'm getting there right now. So the we had a discussion here with Mayor Quill two days ago. We had it with the city manager two weeks ago or uh, two Tuesdays ago. There is a opt out of retail sales uh, provision on marijuana for communities. Uh, they have until December 31st to, to make that decision. I know several of the towns and villages in your district um, have opted out. First of all, do you, do you support the process that they're going through? I think it. I, I think it's imperative that they have the ability to opt out, and I think that it should be left up to those local jurisdictions to to have that decision authority. Should there be retail sales though of marijuana in New York? I personally think no. Okay, because I thought that we had this in the forum that you were in last year. We did. I I thought you were not for this, and that's why I wanted to ask that question. I am totally against it, but that doesn't mean that a locality that thinks that it serves their purposes. And those, the, with those people making that decision uh, on behalf of the people that they represent, it, that that's I think that if they choose to do that, that's okay. That's within their decision realm to be able to do. I just personally don't agree with it. Are you uh, getting any questions from any local leaders about what your views are, or are you telling local leaders how they should do this? No, I am not telling people how they should to, should do it. So you are in your 11th month as a member of the legislature. Correct. You're going to yes. have about 45 days before you all go back to Albany yep. uh, for next session. Besides the budget, and we can get into that in a second, uh, what do you think will be on the docket come January? I think uh, one of the 
one of the biggest things is um, return to uh, budget negotiations. Hopefully, the budget, the next budget we do will be will be significantly less than the previous one. I also hope that uh, many of the veterans initiatives are passed and and perhaps even expanded upon. And so, New York New York veterans don't have a, a uh, Department of Veterans Affairs here, and one of the one of the specific laws would would provide the legal authority to stand that up for the first time. I think that's a really good thing to do. So on the budget issue, so um, Governor Cuomo handled budgets uh, a lot different than maybe his predecessors, yeah. and the governor has enormous power uh, in New York. Doesn't matter who it is it, yes. uh, on the budget fund. But one of the items that has it used to be three men in a room, literally three men. And then it got a little bit of expanded at one point with minority members uh, possibly being in there for some meetings. And then it closed out to now it was uh, two men and a woman back in April. It could be two women and a man uh, now. Do you think there is a chance that it will be all five leaders, so representing the minority council or conferences, or do you just think that's just not likely? I want to think so, but I don't think so. Okay. So what, what do you see as the Republican conference's priorities? The Republican conference's priorities are um, a continuation of what they have been, trying to maintain and improve upon public safety, trying to ensure that we have decent economic development, that we are able to curb the out migration, provide businesses with the with the confidence that they're not going to be taxed into the Stone Age. You know, if you look at the the corporate income tax for businesses earning over five million or more, that's really for for a mid-sized business, that's not a lot of money. It went up from six point seven five to seven seven point two five percent. That's a big that's a big increase. Um, when you look at the overall environment with the inflation we're experiencing, the cost of energy the um, all of the downward pressure on people, businesses, and our institutions. This is going to make for a very challenging year, I, I believe. So I do want to talk about money, yeah. only because next year is not only an election year, but it's also a redistricting year, as yes. you know, and we'll get to that in a, maybe yeah. in a few minutes. Uh, that usually is a recipe for more spending, not less, uh, if the, the last several decades are the case. Do you... Do you see that it's not that you support it, but do you think it is politically inevitable that there will be an uptick in spending next year? I do. So one of the pieces on, <clears throat> the, on that, that front has been that the former governor yeah. who just left um, reined in what we'll call member items or, or commonly known as pork spending, more so that he could give that money out, not necessarily that the money wouldn't be given out. Right. Do you think that there will be a reversion now because Kathy Hochul is not Andrew Cuomo from a persona and uh, for persona, I have other words I could use. Do you think that there is a higher likelihood that those items, such as member items, will come back? I hope that uh, um, that the discretion that the governor holds will be reduced. Okay. So I just think he and had, member items have been based on who's in the majority, yeah. where their seniority is. It's a whole calculation. But but traditionally, if you went back 15 years, and I'll yeah. I'll give a prime example. Mike Nazolio was always known for yeah. you know where where's the money going to be distributed and, and how he does that. So um, the other factor here is school funding. So uh, it is in an election year. Uh, there is this, uh, and I don't think I'm saying it right. Maysto case. That has been settled with the or decided by the appellate court. We'll get to that in a second. But it is an election year. Traditionally, spending for schools goes up in every year from what the governor. Do you yeah. think it'll just skyrocket next year? I hope it doesn't skyrocket. And I I have uh, been working a lot on the education process. We have several things uh, in the works to try to improve the foundation aid formula. Uh, I hope we're successful in doing that. I can't promise that. There's so many. So the Maysto well. case is dealing with Foundation Aid for about eight school districts in upstate. It leaves yeah. places like Auburn out, but as you know, that's one of your biggest constituencies. Yes. So Foundation Aid is important. Yeah. 
do you think foundation aid with this court decision that foundation aid will be resolved next year or do you think it'll take a couple of years i think it'll take longer well, I, I i really do and, i only and say that the, because campaign for fiscal equity has been 15 years right <laughs> you know in the same you know in the in the same vein look at uh um term limits you know it, one of the things i'm going to put forward is, is a term limits bill. I hope okay. I'm I hope I'm successful in doing so, but I know it's going to get shot down by by uh, by. You might have bi yeah, by bipartisan. I will have bipartisan disagreement with that. So well, so let's shift to the last two items from the last three minutes we have. Sure. Uh, the first maps, uh, cartography on your uh, your handheld has come out with the independent commission maps being released. Yes. Uh, what area where you live? In Lafayette, yeah. would you now represent if the map that came out, not from the Democrats or the Republicans, from the Independent Commission, would be? What would your district look like? It would, uh, um, it would look very different than it is now. There, there were there, there. Um, I've got two versions in my head, so I'm not sure exactly okay. which one you're referring to. One is it would essentially go south. It would be a square oh, encompassing okay. most of Portland. That seemed to be geographically more sensible than the, than the current layout. The other would be an elliptical shaped dis district going up into Cicero, starting at the south with towns like uh, Pompey, which is currently not in, that's in the 127th district. So it would be, it would have a significantly different shape. And then there's a Republican plan. Yeah. And that is likely not going to go anywhere. Well, I don't think so. Okay. Realistically. So in the end, what do you think is going to happen for your district? What are you hearing? What, what, what's, not that we've heard a whole lot. I mean, right. we've heard more about how Onondaga County is redistricting yeah. for a year away from now <laughs> than we are that you would start passing petitions in February. Right. So not that the clock's ticking at all. I'm going to be completely honest with you. Very, very little. Uh, I am personally hearing very little. I think there's there's very little going out about this. And I hope that whatever is done, it's done fairly and sensibly for the benefit of, of you know, the whole town concept, the, the community concept. So I don't think you've, you've declared uh, you're running yet. Uh, and I'm not asking for a formal declaration, but uh, unless you want to give it, we'll always take that. But your plan would be to run for re-election. Yes. What would happen if you, would you, anything give you pause if you're faced against, one of the thoughts is out there that a lot of Republicans are going to have to face yeah. Republicans. So we know that on the congressional level with, uh, Claudia Tenney and John Kacko, right. it may happen in the assembly, more so in the assembly than the Senate. What happens if a, not, you have to go in a primary, or do you think that's just not going to occur? It could. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm realistic about all these things that I wouldn't rule anything out at this point. And one of the maps, again, don't quote me on which version it was. I forget which one it was. It, ha it had three Republicans in there. It was Will Barkley, Ken Blankenbush, and uh, uh, Mark Walzik. No. Three Republicans in one assembly district. No. Always, always nice to take on the assembly minority leader. Yeah, uh, there, <laughs> right. there wasn't any politics involved in that design, I'm yeah. sure. We do want to thank you, especially coming into the studio, especially on a very busy day for you. Uh, again, being with the city this morning uh, and the county for uh, Veterans Day, and you're you're going to an event in a little bit. Uh, but our guest has been Assemblyman uh, John Lamontis. We hope you'll come back of in course. the spring live of course because uh, that that works better yeah uh, i think for both of us uh but we would love to have him come back in the spring for an albany update we'll be back in just a moment with a uh, representative from the other house uh senator john Mannion will be here uh give uh, his perspective uh, from the democrats of what's going on in albany and as this is our last day of programming i want to thank the staff here at Hughes community college for these programs and all the forums we did this fall they make it a reality specifically Professor Steve Keeler, Doug Brill, Mike Morano, and Jeff Sesniak. And more importantly, uh, we'd like to thank all the students. This is part of their education, but they make this commitment to this program and these public affairs shows, and we appreciate their commitment as well. Before we go, though, we are planning to come back in the spring. If you'd like to send us your ideas for guests for Inside Government or be on the front page, you can send an email to me at cozgytho at aol.com. And we'll put that on the docket and the agenda for uh, bringing in guests when we return in the spring. For now, I'm Guy Cosentino for Q Community College. I want to thank you for watching. Have a good night. Stick around for Senator Mannion. But otherwise, have a great tomorrow. Be safe and be well and enjoy the holidays.